Uh, my name's Joshua Broyd. Uh, it's nice to meet everybody. Um, uh, I'm a senior AI ML specialist solutions architect uh, at AWS, uh, at Amazon Web Services, and uh, I specialize within AI ML, uh, and I sit within the healthcare and life sciences uh, industry business unit within uh, AWS. So we're essentially a, a very large team of specialists who specialize uh, very broadly within the healthcare and life sciences. Uh, I specialize uh, specifically within AI ML uh, applications uh, and their interplay with the healthcare and life sciences uh, um, at AWS. And again, it's great to meet everybody. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today was how uh, AWS customers are accelerating machine learning, uh, specifically within life sciences and also within healthcare uh, on uh, AWS. Uh, so for uh, AWS has uh, has a number of AI, uh, excuse me, uh, healthcare and life science customers um, uh, who are thinking a lot about AI ML. As I'm sure you know, uh, large language models are also making a very large play broadly, uh, and customers are thinking about those as well. Uh, and this has been going on for quite some time. Here's just a slide that shows a selection. Uh, this is just a selection of some publicly referenceable customers. Uh, both within the life sciences as well as genomics uh, and healthcare uh, who are leveraging AWS for building and deploying and understanding uh, their data using machine learning uh, and AI applications. And you can see, by the way, there are a number of different uh, customers, for example, Pfizer, uh, Change Healthcare. These span uh, everywhere from the life sciences and basic research all the way to commercialization of pharmaceutical uh, products as well as um, uh, the healthcare side, such as health insurance uh, and other related topics. What I wanted to talk about was, uh, I wanted to give specific examples of how customers are leveraging AWS for building, training and uh, deploying uh, models and how they are uh, in turn uh, gaining value from that. But what I first wanted to discuss was very broadly what the machine learning and AI stack looks like at AWS and how we see customers accelerating their AI growth in that context. Joshua, um, I, yes. I was speaking and trying to introduce, I, it goes back to mute for whatever reason, every time I try to, try to speak, hopefully I'm not doing that part. Anyway, uh, I wanted to also add to, uh, to the attendees about you, that you, are specializing in the healthcare and bio uh, areas uh, to provide service to the customers who are in that uh, domain uh, for from from AWS. Yes. To make sure that I added that uh, of what your capabilities are. Yes. Go ahead. Um, so uh, yeah. So to continue with that, at AWS, what we see is uh, customers leveraging three different levels of services, and I'm showing these here as the AI services, uh, the ML services, and at the bottom layer, what we refer to as the ML frameworks and infrastructure. And each of these has different uses as, and components, and we see customers mixing and matching as needed. I'm going to very briefly explain what each of these are, and then I'm just going to jump right into uh, patterns that we're seeing of how uh, AI is being applied within the healthcare and life sciences. The very top layer are the AI services. These are services that allow you to build your, uh, to leverage AI models with your data, but the key value proposition is that you don't have to build uh, the model yourself. Instead, you can just simply pass the data to it, and then the service takes care of all the heavy lifting. So for example, let's take Amazon Omics, which was released uh, uh, at AW, by AWS on this past reInvent. Omics allows you to pass your genomic data straight into the omics and it can be used for storing uh, the underlying uh, genomic data as well as for doing analytics like variant calling and processing your own workloads as well. This is a, and you don't have to build let's say your own uh, genomic storage uh, uh, database. Similarly comprehend can be used for texts and documents so you can pass text to it. Uh, comprehend will then do uh, certain tasks like named entity recognition and then pass it back to your underlying application. 
There are many such services, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Just you know, one, just to pick one more, just to explain a little bit, Amazon Kendra can be used for enterprise search. So you load your documents to it. Kendra uses deep learning models to index uh, the underlying documents, and then you can ask natural language queries from Kendra to extract information from those documents. That's the key value proposition of the AI services, where you don't have to build the models yourself, you just use the service. On the opposite side are the ML frameworks and infrastructure. And this allows uh, data science and AI practitioners to build and train and deploy, really do whatever is needed using the vast AWS compute infrastructure. So for example, AWS uh, Trainium instances can be used, uh, uh, AWS EC2 training instances, excuse me, can be used for training extremely large models, whether distributed training uh, or uh, single instance training. For example, a good use case of this would be training uh, a large language model. Similarly, you can see lots of other examples of compute that customers can use uh, for uh, building their own models as needed. In the middle, we have the ML services, which largely comprises SageMaker. SageMaker essentially allows you to build and train your own models but without focusing on managing the infrastructure. Instead, data scientists and AI practitioners can focus on just that, doing data science and, it, and AI. SageMaker takes care of managing the underlying infrastructure. SageMaker itself um, comprises um, a number of different components, everything from a no-code uh, application that can be used for business analysts, uh, preparing data and labeling data all the way to deploying the underlying models and then uh, managing those models, including even edge deployments. So again, just to summarize this slide, the AI services can be used for uh, using your app, uh, AI in your applications without building models. The ML frameworks and infrastructure allows for complete flexibility of how you want to train your models, whether they're very small linear regressions, for example, or extremely large uh, foundation models. And the ML services sit in between and allow you to build your own models uh, with your own data, but without having to manage the underlying infrastructure. And with that, what I wanted to do was I wanted to focus on some customer examples that we are seeing here at AWS and key trends of the overlap of AI um, and, health, and healthcare and life sciences. There are three broad trends that I wanted to bring to the fore. The first is basic science at scale, which is how can customers um, and really any, uh, any company that's thinking about or any group that's thinking about doing science, uh, basic sciences, how can they do that at scale and they can do that successfully on AWS. The next is intelligent document processing and search. Uh, as I'm sure you've seen in the news and very broadly, large language models are, are, have uh, taken off and can be used for processing text. And enterprises are interested in how can they, in general, leverage uh, AI for uh, processing documents uh, and doing enterprise search. And then finally, a broader theme that I want to mention is the move, and this has been happening for years and is only accelerating, to automation and semi-automation uh, within the context of uh, healthcare and life sciences. And with that, I'm going to jump to uh, some customer examples that I find are particularly interesting. Uh, and feel free to ask questions at the end. Uh, there'll be some time for questions at the end. So the first is I'm going to focus on basic science at scale. This is an example that comes from Moderna. Uh, Moderna uh, specializes in designing uh, mRNA-based therapies, but a key problem that they face is uh, that um, multiple mRNA sequences and structures could be produced in principle. Synthesizing by physical experiments and testing each of these options to figure out which is stable uh, and also viable to chemically synthesize is very time consuming and costly and therefore not really uh, viable at a, on an extremely large scale. Using AW and to solve this, uh, Moderna was seeking to leverage AI to help figure out uh, which of the uh, co potential constructs should be best done. So the workflow for this is shown on the right here. They start with unoptimized mRNA constructs, which are shown uh, by these ribbons. 
They apply AI algorithms to optimize the sequences for production, and then scientists can then order these optimized constructs. This solution uh, was deployed as the Moderna Drug Design Studio and was in turn hosted on AWS Fargate, which allows scientists to design these constructs and in, ad in addition le leverages uh, spot instances. So just to elaborate on this, uh, AWS Fargate uh, is a serverless option that allows you for deploying your own containers, uh, like your Docker images, uh, and you can perform your con you can perform your machine learning or in general any analysis uh, there. Uh, and in order to save on costs, this comes integrated with uh, EC2 spot instances, which allows you to leverage uh, 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 compute at a discount. And the impact of this was increased turnaround time and increased mRNA qualities and importantly, decreased costs. The AI deployed on this infrastructure allows for a much more rapid search space, uh, searching, excuse me, of the search space uh, in Moderna's context. Another example, uh, and this also comes from the uh, basic sciences, comes from Relay Therapeutics. Uh, for those who are familiar, um, who are not yet familiar, uh, docking is a major uh, uh, scientific endeavor that happens when trying to figure out which molecules uh, could best potentially inhibit a target protein. As shown uh, in the schematic on the right, uh, and this is the problem was uh, that Relay Therapeutics was addressing, they have candidate small molecules. So these are small uh, molecules that you want to test whether they will uh, bind to a particular protein at a particular binding site. Uh, so you have a target protein represented in gray, and you have what's referred to as a docking engine. And there are many such algorithms for these, uh, including deep learning based docking engines. And you need to score uh, which molecules are most likely to bind the protein. The problem that was being faced uh, by Relay Therapeutics is that this can be very computationally intensive. Uh, so they leveraged EC2 and AWS Batch to scan uh, 10 billion molecules of interest. And this used up to 100,000 cores and was completed within 24 hours. This kind of scale is not really possible uh, without leveraging uh, AWS. And they were able to scale up to the required CPUs and uh, for their virtual screen. And importantly, this also led to an increased hit rate compared to their purely experimental approach that was previously done. Another example that I want to mention comes from Helixon. Uh, Helixon is a company that uses AI to leverage uh, combining protein function and interaction data, other kinds of data such as genomic data sets and other high throughput methods to design uh, protein-based therapeutics. These kinds of models that are used can be exceptionally uh, large. Uh, this also fits into within a family of what are, uh, that can be large language models or foundation models or diffusion models. Training these kinds of models can be exceptionally uh, compute intensive that requires distributed compute across many different instances. Uh, and uh, I'm showing here in a schematic of uh, conceptually of how this problem sometimes comes out, which is you have an original protein structure, uh, and then you need to optimize or design one component of that structure shown here within uh, the highlighted green, and then you have a new structure. Of course, this is a simplification because this can take into account many different kinds of data sets, uh, but this can be exceptionally uh, compute intensive. And you can see from the quote here that uh, Helixon is looking to train more and more complex models, uh, including leveraging uh, the Trainium-based uh, 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 instances. These are exceptionally large instances that, can, that are specially designed for training very large uh, uh, AI models, including foundation models. The next trend that I wanted to discuss was intelligent document search and processing. Uh, within uh, the healthcare and life sciences. And the problem here that's commonly being faced, this is true in other industries as well, but it's uh, particularly a pain point within healthcare, which is documents can come in at an ex exceptionally large rate. These can be both internal documents, but also external documents. So for example, excuse me, insurance data or insurance forms come in. And frequently these are currently uh, processed uh, by hand. 
So a person has to annotate or extract the relevant data from the underlying documents and then either pass it to an application or potentially label the document. And these workloads can be very complex, very manually uh, driven. And customers are looking for better intelligent document processing uh, uh, and search. A related problem to this is that uh, healthcare and life science or HCLS customers frequently have a large trove of internal documents that they need to search. This can, for example, be uh, scientific liter literature corpuses or other uh, internal documents as well that need to be searched uh, for internal applications. So the one solution to this uh, is using uh, Kendra. And this particular example comes from 3M, where the business need here was that as scientists are doing new research, they need to access underlying information from previous research. And again, these can either be public uh, papers or they can be internal proprietary documents uh, to this. Finding information uh, can be very exhausting and time consuming. Uh, I don't know if anyone in the audience here has experienced this, but you know, it can be a common problem. I, know, I need to find something out. I, have a I know that my information is within a corpus of data, but searching for it can be very complex. So the solution that 3M leveraged is using Kendra, Amazon Kendra, to help their scientists find the information they need. And with a key, the key idea is that this can handle natu natural language queries both quickly and accurately, and I'll also add intelligently, so that it understands the uh, nature of the query and will find uh, the corresponding uh, document and as well, potential, depending on the nature of the query, uh, where within the document it's located and the answer. The impact of this, I think, is clear, which is that this allows engineers and researchers to find the information faster so that uh, scientists can do their own job uh, better and innovate faster and more quickly. The next example that I want to mention around this comes from uh, Gilead. Uh, Gilead Sciences uh, had a business need of bringing together a large data set uh, and really actually a plethora of data sets from many different enterprises across uh, their value chain. Uh, this could include regulatory compliance, supply chain, manufacturing, really all kinds of extremely diverse data sets uh, that, uh, um, that uh, users needed access to to answer their underlying questions. This particular solution did leverage Kendra, but I want to also emphasize chain together with other AI components, including Textract, which can be used for extracting uh, otherwise locked data from images or uh, other components. Uh, like PDFs, as well as their own custom models with SageMaker. So the overall built solution uh, had a, was a scalable enterprise search, leveraged both the AI service Kendra, but also custom models for doing, uh, uh, for doing their own custom search as needed. And the impact of this is that this reduced uh, manual data management by about 50%, as well as the uh, need to search by about 50%. And they were able to build a data lake that incorporated all of this data um, within only three months and included about uh, one terabyte, including unstructured health data. And I want to emphasize two things in this particular example. One is, is that um, more and more within the healthcare and life science industry, there's an emphasis on unlocking uh, health data. Uh, excuse me, unstructured health data. So not just tables, but uh, documents need to be analyzed and understood as well. Uh, and this kind of solution allows for something like that at an enterprise uh, search level. Oh, and I want to emphasize one more theme about this that just to consider as you're thinking about how to deploy your own models, which is this particular solution leverages both uh, services as well as custom models within SageMaker. And this is a key pattern that we see, which is you have the freedom within AWS to leverage your own models. And we encourage building your own models, for example, custom large language models uh, or other or uh, stable diffusion models or even smaller models as needed. But uh, when leveraging that, you also want to consider if there's a service that fits your use case, then you can potentially more quickly deploy uh, 
uh, as needed using those services. The next theme that I want to mention is automation and semi-automation. And uh, again, I would say this has been going on for a number of years now, but it's accelerating, which is components of workloads uh, that used to rely on purely manual um, uh, uh, work, for example, humans classifying documents, now are being moved in one of two ways. One is that the workload can be fully automated in some contexts uh, when appropriate. And the other is, is that if there's either a blocker that uh, uh, a particular workload can't be fully automated, or if there's regulatory compliance that requires manual supervision, then at the very least, uh, AI can be brought in as uh, a semi-automated option or a decision support operation. And I'm gonna give a few examples of this. This example comes from Amgen. So the context of this is that when, uh, if an adverse event for a drug uh, occurs and is notified, a pharmaceutical company has a, to report that to the FDA within 24 hours. For those who are maybe not familiar, an adverse event is when a person takes a drug and then that drug uh, causes an unexpected negative behavior. So these have to be reported to the federal government uh, and pharmaceutical companies obviously want to uh, know about them as much as possible. This can be an extremely complex problem, both from an AI perspective, but also from an engineering perspective, because uh, different uh, events can be reported in multi ways. They might be reported in a phone call or via uh, textual, like a, an email or uh, other or or in other ways. So you have multiple channels for uh, achieving for even receiving the reports. So it's an engineering feat to figure out how to consolidate all of this. On the AI side, of course, classifying is, if you see an adverse event uh, is itself complex, um, uh, is itself complex as well. In this particular context, uh, Amgen leveraged Transcribe Medical, which is an AI service specifically geared for transcribing medical texts um, and their own custom models for using natural, that uses natural language processing or understanding to classify if an adverse event uh, is happening. The classification algorithm led to accurate and fast results with an accuracy of over 95%. And I wanna emphasize something. This is meant to assist manual assessment. Uh, reporting adverse events is obviously very important and you need to have supremely excellent accuracy when doing it. But the AI here, even if it's not fully automated at the very least can aid uh, humans as they're doing their work uh, and allow humans to scale out where they're needed. This is a more healthcare uh, focused example uh, that comes from CHOP or Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And you can see from the quote here, but let me first discuss the business need. Multimodal data in healthcare and life sciences is becoming more and more important. And when I say multimodal, what I mean here is that data sets come from vast disparate sources. They can include tabular data sets, natural language, omics data, interactions with the healthcare system, uh, et cetera. And bringing together clinical data sets uh, and omics data sets uh, is uh, complex. Um, and uh, CHOP, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia faces this issue of giving a comprehensive view of patients is can be very complicated by uh, combining omics, uh, by using Amazon omics, which I mentioned before, uh, allows for a managed way of uh, storing and analyzing your genomic data. Uh, you can expand your understanding of your patient's health. The next example here comes from AstraZeneca. Uh, and the use case here is uh, understanding kidney injury was a process that was being done in a fully manu manual uh, way. Uh, and of course, this is very laborious to pathologists who have to look at this underlying uh, slides and then essentially label on their own where there's an injury and where there's not. And the solution here was by uh, leveraging uh, AI models, in this particular context, a uh, single shot multi-box detection or SSD, they were, they were able to uh, remove a large burden from the manual labelers by having AI first take a, a, a first try to do the object detection within uh, their context. You can see here, 
the ground truth here is labeled, uh, and then uh, they're using object detection algorithms to detect these. Uh, and I want to also highlight this on, on two themes here. One is, again, this is assisting manual processes. And the other is, is that uh, while when training your own models, you're going to also frequently, not always, but in many cases, do some amount of labeling your own data. Uh, and that can also be done within the AWS ecosystem. We have services like Ground Truth where labelers can uh, label their own data or have workforces label their data. Uh, here's another example. Um, uh, this example comes from Cortica. Uh, Cortica uh, was ingesting very large amounts of healthcare uh, and uh, data. And the challenge that they were facing is that akin to some of the examples I mentioned before, uh, the healthcare data itself comes with many different vocabularies and different code types. Developers were spending and in uh, too much time essentially translating from these underlying data types to a standardized data model before they can do ETL or uh, extract, transform, and load into uh, their data sets. So the bottleneck here was that uh, they were spending too much time uh, with this pre-processing of the underlying data and not enough on the actual analysis on the data. And in this particular context, uh, their goal was to be able to present to caregivers a composite view of the patient's healthcare journey, either over time or other variables as well. In order to better standardize this, uh, what Cortica did is they adopted HealthLake. HealthLake allows ingesting of fire data, uh, which is commonly used uh, in the healthcare industry um, uh, for, uh, for example, for like patient data. And uh, this standardization uh, and ingestion of data allowed uh, Cortica to accelerate its ETL process with the ultimate impact that the Cortica team was able to spend more and more time uh, analyzing and understanding their data patterns rather than spending uh, time on gathering data and organizing the data and formatting the data. And I want to emphasize here a key component also, which is services like HealthLake frequently uh, don't stand alone. Instead, they can be integrated uh, with other uh, AWS services or third-party applications. So in this particular example, uh, this slide is a little bit small, but I'm just going to go through this uh, architecture. Data is first ingested into S3, which is essentially uh, unlimited object store and then ingested into HealthLake. But uh, that's not where the journey stops. They also use yet another S3 bucket and uh, modeling as well within SageMaker. But this is then output to uh, Amazon Athena, which allows for querying the underlying data. And then this can be visualized with uh, business intelligence tools. In this particular example, they're using QuickSight. But the key idea is that you can use third-party applications to interact uh, uh, excuse me, third-party applications, excuse me, or services to interact with the underlying data. These are just uh, graphs of uh, types of analyses that they were seeing and performing uh, using Amazon QuickSight for uh, understanding their business, uh, excuse me, their patient uh, journey. Um, I think that's all the slides that I had wanted uh, to show, but I'll kind of, but I'll end off by saying that uh, the key, and I'll actually go back to the slide that I'd shown at the beginning because it, it bears worth repeating, that uh, the what we're seeing at AWS uh, theme-wise is, is that as customers look to build their own models, they're using a combination of different tools. More and more customers, and I just wanted to emphasize this, are considering building larger and larger uh, language models or uh, deep learning uh, models. And for those, we see customers who are using both Amazon SageMaker uh, and different features of SageMaker, as well as uh, deploying their own infrastructure on AWS. Uh, and this can leverage everything from uh, preparing your data, uh, including labeling your data, feature stores so that you can store your features, detecting uh, bias uh, in your underlying data, and going through the rest of the value chain of AI all the way to uh, deploying your models, explaining the predictions, 
managing the deployed models and including, I didn't really discuss this in these particular slides, but we also have uh, a set of tools for deploying uh, models to edge devices, which also can be of particular impact um, uh, to uh, the underlying uh, models uh, and, uh, and services. So I think that's a few minutes early, but I, those were the slides that I wanted to present and I'm happy to 